Thank you. Good evening. How does a notion become a concept and then a trend and then a force and finally a worldwide movement? Well, it helps immeasurably to have an expert proselytizer who understands the concept and has the ability to spread the good news around the world. In other words, it helps to have someone like Carl Honoré. Now, though he may cringe at the title, I think Mr. Honoré is the world's leading evangelist for what has become known as the slow movement. But in spreading the gospel of slow, he is not suggesting for a moment that we all do everything in our lives at a snail's pace, simply that we all stop living in our lives on a constant fast forward. His first book, In Praise of Slow, galvanized international interest in changing the way we live. His next book was called Under Pressure, and it critically examined how we parents are micromanaging our children's lives. Now with his latest book, The Slow Fix, Mr. Honoré shows how changing our neurotic relationship to time can change our lives for the better. Mr. Honoré was born in Scotland, but he grew up in Edmonton, which he claims as his real hometown. He was graduated from the University of Edinburgh with degrees in history and Italian. He has worked with street children in Brazil with Canada World Youth, and he has traveled and reported internationally for leading newspapers and magazines. Currently, he lives in London with his wife and two children. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Carl Honoré. Thanks very much. Thank you for joining us, well, for coming. Thank you for that very generous introduction. <laughs> Did you come all the way from Edmonton? And how cold was it there? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to Edmonton, and I'm guessing that it's very cold already. <laughs> Safe bet. I want to start with how you first became aware of and then got involved with the slow movement. It has to do with something about you re you're reading your son a bedtime story. What was that? That's right. I, now we're going back to probably 10, 11 years. I was working as a foreign correspondent, and I had become a, a roadrunner. Every moment of my day was a race against the clock. And that virus of hurry had infected every corner of my life, including that sacred, slow ritual of reading a bedtime story to my son. So I would go into his room at the end of the evening, and I just could not slow down. So I would be sitting on his bed with one foot on the floor, speed reading Snow White, you know, <laughs> skipping lines, paragraphs, and whole pages. And in fact, I became an expert in a technique that I dubbed the multiple page turn technique. <laughs> See, I, know there, I knew there were a lot of parents. <laughs> 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 sort of rueful giggles. And, and, and this, you know, this went on for quite some time. We were constantly in conflict, because my son, like every four-year-old, knew the books inside out. So it should have been the most relaxed, the most intimate, the most tender, the most magical moment of the day uh, became instead of war between my speed and his slowness. Did, didn't you find somewhere there was a one-minute bedtime? Coming to it. I'm coming there. Yeah, that's right. I guess it's, amazing. Yeah. it's astounding. And, well, so we, were, so we were constantly in conflict, and my, you know, my, my son would say, why are there only three dwarves in the story tonight? Yeah. <laughs> What happened to Grumpy? <laughs> and, and as you say, uh, the, the moment of truth for me, the moment of personal epiphany came when I found myself speed reading a newspaper article with time-saving tips. And one of these tips <laughs> talked about this book called The One Minute Bedtime Story. And in other words, Snow White boiled down into 60 seconds. And I remember thinking, hallelujah, you know, <laughs> I, I'm going to get this from FedEx you know, tomorrow from Amazon. Uh, but thankfully, I had a second reaction. And it was the light bulb over the head moment. I thought, whoa, is it? Has it really come to this? Am I really in such a hurry that I'm prepared to fob off my son with a soundbite at the end of the day? And that was when I began to look at my own addiction to speed. But as a writer, of course, I wanted to understand the bigger picture. And I began traveling around the world and uh, very quickly discovered that I wasn't alone and that there was another way to think about things like this. It's encouraging to know that you were as addicted as the, as the, as the rest of us are. But 
what is the source of the addiction to speed? Why, why do we live the way we do in terms of hurry up? I, I think there's a, a cocktail of reasons. I think partly, I think partly it's human hardwiring. You know that we are programmed to seek out short-term thrills and rewards. Uh, I mean, if you think back to the savanna, early man, there was not much incentive to sit back, stroke your chin, and contemplate the Aristotelian long view. You know, it was just, it was the here and now, it was the survival of the fastest. Uh, I think also there's a, a kind of metaphysical dimension that speed in a way becomes an instrument of denial. It's a way of running away from deeper questions and bigger problems. Uh, and that's why therapists often talk about acceleration as being the final stage before burnout. You know, you have one last surge of speed as you're running away from all those problems. And then, of course, the, the Industrial Revolution, which created machines, that allowed us to do more and more things more quickly. And then we've had another great leap forward in the way of speed with the information technology revolution, which has allowed everything to happen now at the speed of software and conditioned us to expect things to happen at the click of a mouse. Let's just stay with the savannah for a moment. There's some science, as I understand it, and believe me, it's a very rude understanding, that in early times when man was confronted by a lion or something, there wasn't a lot of time to discuss options. <laughs> you just had to get the hell out of there. Is that, and is that exactly. where it comes from? Essentially, or? it's this idea, and any time you stray into the world of neuroscience, you've got to stray carefully and tread lightly because we, we know so little, really, in the greater scheme of things. But I think we're getting to the point where we do know that there are, roughly speaking, two forms of thinking, and people talk about system one and system two. And system one is that instant, instinctive, intuitive, shoot from the hip kind of reaction. As you see the, the saber-toothed tiger gazing at you across the pond, your brain instantly maps an escape course through the, you go, you're down it. Yeah. Quick fix, done and dusted. System two is the more considered thought. You know, when someone asks you, what is 32 times 14? Or to, when you're asked to contemplate what a social policy would mean for downtown uh, Montreal. That's a different kind of mode of thought. So. Clearly, in the old days, I think that the, the system one was probably much more called upon and much more sure. useful um, than, than it is today. Uh, the trouble is, of course, we have the same brains. <laughs> and we live in a world now where we need much more system two thinking. We need much more slow thinking. But we are almost hardwired, I think, to reach first for the easy fix, the quick fix, the, the system one approach. I want to get at the system two in a moment, but the quick fix, mm -hmm. um, it's everywhere. It seems to infect, if that's the word, certainly influence or inform almost every area of our life. It does. Is there, in the book, I read that there is a quick yoga, is, there, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, even, this is, even the things that are by their very nature slow and designed to slow us down, we're trying to speed them up too. So there is, in fact, near my house in London, a gym that runs a speed yoga course. Speed yoga. <laughs> speed yoga for time starved professionals who want to salute the sun and bend their bodies into the lotus position, but they want to do it in 20 minutes instead of a whole hour. <laughs> so, you know, and, and in fact, even, even these deepest rituals that are all about slowing down, we are, they have been infected by this vir virus of hurry as well. I was in um, Austri Austria and Vienna a little while ago, and I, I met the, the Monsignor who was in charge of one of the cathedrals in Vienna, mm -hmm. thousand-year-old cathedral, everything very, very serene. Um, Gregorian chants, and he came up to me after an event and said, I'd been talking about slowing down, and he said to me, you know, I have a confession to make. And any time a Catholic priest comes up to us, <laughs> you're on your guard, right? <laughs> uh, but thankfully, we didn't go down that road. Uh, he said, I listened to you speaking, and I suddenly realized that how easy it is to get infected by this virus of hurry. I've been praying too fast, right? <laughs> so it, 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 as you say, it shows that even, even in those activities, those tasks that are all about being still, being yeah. contemplative, uh, pondering, ruminating, we still want to go for that quick fix option. It reminds me of Woody Allen saying that he had taken a speed reading course and had read <laughs> War and Peace, and when asked about it, said it's about Russia. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Isn't it, though, um, a worthy thing if, as a professional, a worker, um, to be able to do something quickly, efficiently, 
and in a proper way. If the boss says, I want this report yesterday, what choice do I have? It, it, is, isn't it something, well, the, it's a marketable skill, isn't it? That well, the first part of your question, the, the answer is, is, is absolutely yes, of course. It's useful to be efficient and quick and to do things within deadlines. And I talk about, my book is called The Slow Fix, uh, but that doesn't mean that we have to fix everything very, very slowly. I mean, of course, there are times to, to fix things quickly if you're in a restaurant and the diner at a nearby table starts choking on a morsel of food, again, you don't sit back and convene a committee. You get in there and deliver the Heimlich maneuver, don't right. you? Right? And, and that's, of course, that makes perfect sense. The trouble is that it seems to me that culturally, we've backed ourselves into a corner where we arrive at every problem, even the most tangled, multi-layered, complex problems, looking for a Heimlich solution, right? Uh, maximum return, fastest results with minimum effort. What are the consequences of that, of, behave, of acting like that and of thinking like that? What are the consequences to us? I think that this roadrunner speedaholic culture is taking a toll on, on every aspect of our lives. I think it's backfiring on our health and diet, on our relationships and communities. It's doing harm to uh, our work and productivity and to the to the economy in general, the environment, of course. I mean, even if you think about fast decisions, we were talking about a moment ago, uh, you look at what happened in the financial markets in 2008 with that meltdown. A great deal of that, I think, comes down to the fact that money got too fast, you know, that it was just too speedy for people to make good decisions. Well, you talk in the book, in the slow fix, you talk about Bill Gates, uh, Microsoft, and his uh, laudable efforts in worldwide and global health and how he set up a program to get it done fast. And it's interesting that Bill Gates comes from that engine of speed, yeah. that is the Silicon Valley and all of that, and, and they come with this idea that somehow if you spend a lot of money and write really good algorithms, you can solve every problem very, very fast. And Bill Gates discovered, uh, to his dismay, that that's not the case. He put out, I, I've forgotten the exact figure, it was something like 400 million, it was a huge amount of money was offered, tendered, thousands of projects came in, they picked a bunch and they were going to, revolutionized world health in five years, and then five years later, uh, they hadn't revolutionized world health. And he, and he said, admitted that. He admitted that. He, he said, said. We, he's, the, his words were, we were naive. Tell me about the rise and fall of Toyota, and specifically, I never heard this before, pulling the Andon rope. Mm. It's a wonderful image and metaphor. And in fact, it was, I wanted to use it as a title of my book, but my publishers persuaded me that it was too obscure. <laughs> so, right. I, so I went with a slow fix in the end. But the, the, the story of Toyota is that in fact, if you go back, Toyota was a supreme practitioner of the slow fix because they had this rope, they still do from their factories hanging in every factory called the Andon rope or the Andon cord. And if anything went wrong on an assembly line, even the lowliest worker could pull the Andon rope and a light would go on and his team leader would come and they'd look at the problem and they would ask themselves why, why, why until they got to the, the heart of the matter, what was really wrong, and then they would fix it. And if they couldn't fix it on the spot, they would actually stop the whole assembly line until they got it fixed. And that to me is the slow fix in action. But what happened when Toyota decided that it wanted to become the number one car maker in the world is that effectively it stopped pulling the Andon rope. They began having problems and ignoring them. Uh, they were getting emails and memos sent up from staff on the ground and on the trenches warning of things going wrong that were just ignored, that weren't dealt with. And we all know where that ended up, don't Largest we? Largest recall you know, in history. 10 million cars recalled, shredded reputation, and what was it, 2 billion in lawsuits yeah, pending? I yeah. mean, and, and that's a, a, a quick fix gone wrong writ large, but right across the culture you see examples of this. I mean, the Iraq war is a good one. Uh, you know, when we were amassing troops on the border to go into Iraq in 03, was it? Uh, Rumsfeld famously said, this will take, I reckon, six days, yeah. six yeah. weeks at the most. Again, we know how that one ended. <laughs> Why is it important? You make the point that in trying to redevelop the, the quick fix or, or upholster your life in such a way that you don't do that anymore, you said it's important to admit mistakes. And you use as an example an RAF pilot. Yeah. What's the connection there? I didn't. Well, I think that admitting mistakes is, is often the first step to building a slow fix. Because, oh, so. we, we, because when, we, when, when a problem presents itself, 
usually one of the reasons is that someone has made a mistake or something has gone wrong. And until we take the time to confront that mistake and deal with the emotional fallout that goes with the shame and the, the embarrassment uh, that that um, uh, provokes, and then also take the time to learn from the mistake, then we can't really move on to developing a slow fix. So this RAF example, the Royal Air Force in Britain, they've, were disco they discovered that a lot of the mistakes that people were making were just being uh, covered up. They weren't being shared. And because of that, people were dying. The planes were crashing. Problems weren't being un um, uncovered. So they devised a whole system to encourage everybody in the RAF, from the most humble mechanic uh, to the, m the most glamorous, lantern-jawed, Top Gun pilot, to own up to every single mistake and found very quickly that they were starting to solve problems, in fact, before the problems even arose, because they would, a small near miss that would have just been brushed aside or ignored in the past was then brought to the, the attention of the authorities who investigated it and often would avoid a, a small problem becoming a bigger one later, which in a way underlines the delicious paradox of the slow fix, mm -hmm. which is that sometimes <clears throat> it's not that slow. You know, Sometimes the results are not only better than a quick fix, but you get them more quickly. I've always been puzzled in anything to do with airplanes why it's called a near miss, because it's really a near hit, isn't it? <laughs> I mean... Yeah, exactly. When, yeah. when you know... When you think, <laughs> has, in your exploration of the subject, has, is there a culture or a society where slowing down has actually worked at various levels, either in government or private enterprise, private industry, or education, or culturally? I, people always ask me that question, and I, I don't think that there is a one country that stands out as the top of the league table for it. What I do think is that each country has some good slow in it, and some uh, bad slow, and good, good fast, and bad fast. And some countries do some things slow very well. So you mentioned education. The Finland, Finland is famous for having a, an enormously successful education. And it has a lot of slow uh, ethos to it. You know, children don't start schooling until the age, the year in which they turn seven. They spend fewer hours in the classroom. They do less homework. There's no tutoring industry. They don't sit hardly any exams apart from, um, you know, later in, in their careers. And then when they do sit down to do the international PISA exams at the age of 15, competing against 500,000 kids from around the world, they routinely come out top or very near top, one or two, top yeah. of the chart. Yeah. Charts. So, so that's one example in Finland. Uh, people think of the Italians as being you know, wonderfully slow with food. And of course, mm. slow food uh, grew from the Italian culture of uh, you know, mangiare bene and sitting around the table and all that stuff that we, we hanker after in the Anglo-Saxon world where it's all about ready meals and, and microwaves. But then on the other side, the Italians, if you've ever driven on an Italian highway, <laughs> you know, you know that the Italians uh, are in touch with their inner hair as well as their inner tortoise, right? So. <laughs> Can you connect, is there a, a connection, a viable working connection between the slow fix and creativity? Hugely. I think that there's an intimate bond between slowness and creativity. How so? I think that when, I mean, this is something that you find throughout history and throughout disciplines as well, that artists will talk about that moment in the creative journey when, when you forget the clock. People talk about being in a state of flow when they forget the clock, they forget time, it's a timeless moment. And also those moments of fogginess, blurriness, uncertainty, when you can just about, just about discern the silhouette of what's coming uh, and you feel a bit uncomfortable, but you sit with it and you come out the other end. And that's something that you hear from scientists, it's something you hear from engineers, designers, that there's always a moment of of slowing down somewhere in the creative process. And that's why the most creative companies and organizations in the world are trying to claw back little moments and spaces for people to slow down, whether it's, I mean, a classic example is, is, um, is Google with its famous 20% rule. What is that? Uh, they, 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 if, there's been a slight modification of it recently, but essentially what they did was they gave, uh, allowed their engineers and creative people to, to devote 20% of their working time to personal projects. So, you know, no timetables, no targets, just that kind of free-flowing, almost a kind of daydreamy thing. And it sounds on the face of it like a waste of time or a slacker's charter. But in fact, of course, what happened is that, you know, many of Google's home-run products like Gmail and, um, 
news, which or the news, Wanji News or Google News, came out of that 20% time because people were able to slip into that richer, more nuanced form of thinking. Uh, I mean, there's been some research also that suggests that the brain waves, when we're in a relaxed state, move into a, a more complex pattern, and therefore we get this these creative breakthroughs. Psychologists refer to that as slow thinking. And in fact, I think we all know that, don't, don't we, from our personal lives, whatever work we do, we know that our best ideas seldom come when we're juggling nine emails or racing to meet a five o'clock deadline with the boss hanging over our shoulder. They come when we're soaking in the bath, right? Or walking in the park with the phone switched off or swinging in a hammock. I forget who said it, but it was something like the problems of the world are caused by the inability of people to sit quietly in a room alone for an hour that because we don't, there's no contemplative side to that. Um, under pressure, I want to talk just a bit about that. That was a look at how we, and I include myself, are parenting our children these days. And you use the phrase, the free range child. What, do you, what, did, yeah. what did you mean by that? Well, I, as you're, I grew up in, in Canada and my childhood was kind of the 70s and the 80s. And I think anyone in the room who grew up probably before about the mid 90s will have the same memory of childhood being what um, Virginia Woolf called a great cathedral of, of space, you know, that kind of um, feeling of amplitude, of, of not being scheduled to within an inch of your life, of spending all of your time outdoors, you know, that thing you'd, you'd say to your mom, I'm bored, and she'd just kick you outside, and you'd go out and run wild with the local kids, and then you'd hear, lunch, and you'd come back, and you'd go out again, it would be dinner, and that sort of thing. And it's, it's, that has been completely jettisoned now, as children live like mini adults with uh, their own personal planners and uh, schedules. Play date. I'd never heard the, the phrase. Exactly, yes. Play date. Well, we've, prof we've professionalized child rearing so that playing, free play, just children messing around. And, and we know from the research that that is when, you know, we, we've seen it in our own lives. You know, that a child is walking, to, you're walking down the street with your four-year-old daughter and she spots a ladybug on a rose bush. And she can stop there for 20 minutes and give, she'll give that ladybug a name. She'll weave a whole narrative around it. She'll watch it scuttling up and down the rose bush. And we know from you know, brain research and, and everything about science tells us that in that moment, her brain is on fire. You know? She is building her brain with extraordinary fireworks. And yet we see that nowadays and we think, that kind of looks like a waste of time. <laughs> so we separate her from the ladybug, grab her by the wrist and say, come on, we're late for ballet. And off we go. And, and I think it's those ladybug moments that have been squeezed out of the childhood experience now. And that's in a way what I think of as a free range childhood is, is the, the freedom to the time, space and freedom to explore the world on your own terms rather than have it spoon fed to you and micromanaged. One of the most depressing things I saw a couple of weeks ago, a, a man walking down Young Street with I took to be his four or five year old daughter by the hand and he was on his phone. Yeah. Um, was there something more important than being with your daughter that was, that was on the phone? It, it, um, you also talk about slow cities. Mm. We live, we don't live in a city in, in Toronto. We live in a parking lot. <laughs> and uh, it's almost impossible now to get from, from A to B, but we're rushing at it. Mm. What is a slow city? Well, a s slow city with a capital S and a capital C, there is actually a f an official movement which started again in Italy, but has spread across Europe and beyond. Thank God for the Italians, yeah, right? They got, they've got some things right. right. <laughs> uh, and, and the slow city, I mean, the, that particular movement is, is aimed at cities of up to 50,000 inhabitants, and there's a long list of um, changes they need to make, but it, essentially it boils down to redesigning and rethinking the urban landscape in ways that encourage people to slow down, to smell the proverbial roses, to put on the brakes. So closing roads to traffic, you know, more green spaces, that sort of thing. Uh, but in some ways, I think being a slow city is greater than the sum of those parts. It's a bit like a philosophical declaration. It's like a whole town coming together mm -hmm. and saying, we understand that slow is good, that slowness has a role to play in the 21st century. And, and that is very liberating because people, even, you know, there's the, t the taboo against slowing down is so embedded and so ingrained in our culture that even when we can feel in our bones that it would be good for us to put on the brakes. Our, our bodies are telling us, our minds, our souls are crying out 
for a little bit of slowing down. Then we're, what's the problem? We're ashamed to do it. We're afraid to do it. Why, though? Is it embarrassing or are we afraid of... I think you had an expression about not keeping up with the Jones or something. I mean, yeah, it is that. I think it's, I mean, it's, it's woven into our vernacular, isn't it? You know, you snooze, you lose. The early bird catches the worm. All these <laughs> phrases are there bombarding us with this idea that if you slow down, you're lazy, you're boring, you're roadkill, right? Um, and that slow is almost a dirty word. It's a pejorative. It's a, it's a four-letter word in our culture so that people are afraid to, I mean, I think that the slow movement has done a lot to recapture that word. Uh, but that, that taboo remains and lingers. And I, mean, I, I was sitting on a plane with a, uh, uh, beside a, a, an American lawyer uh, a little while ago from Philadelphia, a woman who, you know, working, a, you know, typical American lawyer working a 90-hour week, having three days of holiday a yeah. year. And they, they had a, it was, the, the, her b section of the office was closed down. They were having some repairs and the mainframe was shut. She couldn't do anything, so she had to spend the day at home. And she went home, she felt a bit restless, but she kind of went with it, made a salad, read, had a nap, hadn't done it in years, had a most wonderful day she'd had in a decade, she told me. But she said, the next day I went back into the office and all my colleagues said, what did you do yesterday? And she said, it was terrible. I, I found myself opening my mouth and inventing things I'd done because, because I was ashamed to say that I'd kind of done nothing and that I'd, I'd sort of liked it, you know? And it's that shame that is, I think, holds us back off and the fear of being pilloried, vilified, ridiculed, brushed aside. But have you not been in a, in a situation where um, you have a down day and you start to get twitchy, you break out into a sweat, you don't, know, you don't know how to have the nap and you can't read more than four pages of the book and you think, my God, I want to go back to the office. I personally do not have those days anymore. No, <laughs> yeah, I have to say, but, but I, recognize, I, so, right? I recognize the symptoms <laughs> because I've been there. <laughs> But I, I, I definitely have a before and after, and my before was, I used to feel that little itchy, sick feeling of, you know, what can I do next? And I always, I, I don't wear a watch anymore. I used to be looking at my watch I noticed all the you time. don't wear yeah. a wristwatch. Um, and I'm very punctual. I'm never late. But I... How does that uh, work? I think... Yeah. <laughs> well, at, at the moment, I'm on a book tour, so I've got somebody with me who's got to watch with her. But... Um, no, I think I've got a good, a pretty accurate internal clock. And also, you know, we're surrounded by clocks. They're everywhere, aren't they? Yeah. And I find, in fact, sometimes if I'm in a foreign city or I'm somewhere even in London and I don't know what time it is, like, I'll ask somebody. You know, I'll do that unthinkable thing, which is speak to a stranger. And I've, I've had some quite interesting conversations off the back of that, you know? Um, so. The American, there was an American writer named Nicholas Carr, uh, and a few years ago he wrote a piece in The Atlantic entitled, Is Google Making Us Stupid? And he said that he found, since using Google and various devices, he had lost what he calls deep reading ability. He could sit down prior to this and read for three or four hours. Now, he said, after 40 minutes, his attention wanders. Do you find, are you a slow reader, or how do you? Uh, do you I, I recognize that phenomenon, and I think you've got to be very disciplined about the use of these gadgets. And, and they are wonderful, joyously addictive, and I have them all. But they, they all come with that little red button that says off. And, and I, I went through a long time of never using that, but now I use it a lot. And I think it's that changing of gears. It's saying, okay, there are times when I'm on my iPhone, there are times when I'm tweeting, and I'm on Facebook, and I'm doing my social network dance and all that. But I'm not going to be on that all the time. And I think, I think the brain needs those moments of you know, shifting out of high speed to low speed and all that diff those different tempos and paces. And I think that allows you to, to retain the ability to to read deeply. I mean, I saw a very interesting uh, program about a high school that's up in the mountains in Vermont where young Am American kids, teenagers are going who are addicted to gadgets. You know, right. Who, 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 I mean, deep reading, forget it, they can barely get through a blog post, right? right. A tweet is long for them. And, and, they were, and they arrive at this place, and of course they have withdrawal symptoms, but they start to, after a week, I mean, after a couple of days, they're just, they, they, they're in love with the place because they're finding this deeper rhythm they're learning that you can have a conversation with somebody without fiddling below the table with your pocket, you know, and sometimes it's uncomfortable, you know, you don't necessarily know what you're going to say, but there's a kind of learning and it's part of being alive to be uncomfortable sometimes. And, and it's remarkable. And in fact, one of the reasons I feel optimistic that we can turn around this speedaholic super tanker is that it's the young people, I find, who are more and more all over this idea that it's, it's too fast and they want to find a different gear. But you're a writer, you were a foreign correspondent, you had to face, as we all do, deadlines. And the, the tradition in journalism, the deadlines are inviolable, you do not miss 
a deadline. Isn't that a form of, of being controlled or managed by, if not speed, certainly pressure, to deliver a certain thing at a certain time? Absolutely. And I think deadlines are... A, a, they're a kind of double-edged sword because in some ways they're very useful. They focus the mind. And if you have a procrastination gene, they're useful for getting you, getting you to d deliver the goods on time. And that's important. The, the trouble, I think, is that we fall into deadline mode. So we're in the office and we've got to deliver that quarterly report or the article or whatever it is by 6 p.m. We get through it, we deliver, we go home, and we're still on deadline mode. We're eating our dinner as though the boss is waiting us for us to finish, you know? And I think it's, again, it's about being aware that we get stuck in those modes and finding little levers, little things to do to, whether it's as simple as just breathing f deeply four or five times, you know, and reoxygenating the body, lowering the blood pressure, something as small as that, um, which no, you know, is, no boss is going to begrudge you five deep breaths. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he might even join you. Um, you don't know the CBC, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Although, actually, no, I think about it. I'm not sure if you want to be sharing heavy breathing with your boss. I mean, that, that could end in, in trouble, couldn't it? <laughs> Lawsuits, possibly. There was a story a couple of years ago about a department of government in Ottawa where the deputy minister told his staff that from Friday night until Monday morning, they were not to use their Blackberries. They were not to communicate in any way with that. The idea being that people could unwind or decompress. And some people complained about it and said, that's unfair, we want to use her. So how do you change the way we think in order to change the way we act? Mm. I think you have to, that sort of, an example like that, you have to do it in uh, baby steps. And you have to go with the people who want to go with it and gradually bring along <laughs> the people who don't. Uh, and I think once the people who, often you'll find that the people who don't are resisting through fear. And once they see that it works for the other people, it works for the team, that everybody is happier, healthier, enjoying their family time more, and coming back to the office sharper with better ideas, because you've had that time away from the coal face, uh, I think you start to bring people around. And, and you, you mentioned that one example that was a, an intriguing one in, in Britain, where when David Cameron took over as prime minister, what are we now, three years ago, I guess, uh, the, his first act, well, decree as prime minister was to ban the use of smartphones in all cabinet meetings. Really? Just to get people to focus, right? You know, to pay attention. And Were they found- people on the phone in cabinet meetings? Even in cabinet meetings, when they're just, I mean, which may explain some of the really bad decisions we get for our <laughs> governments, you know? Um, and, and I spoke to somebody who's in that world and they said it did make, you know, people did chafe against it at first. They thought, why do I have to stop looking at yeah. my inbox? But over time they came around and, and it worked. How do you embed the idea of Sloan in your daily life? How do you, do you, do you have a schedule or do you get up and, you know, do you compartmentalize? I, or? Yes, I suppose I, I do have a schedule in the sense that I've got children who impose a schedule. So sure. there's a child, you know, one to get up at seven and another one goes to school a bit later. And then I come home and we have just, just family dinner every evening um, of the week, unless I'm traveling. Uh, I come home for time for dinner. So those, that bookends my day. Uh, but otherwise, I, I try not to overschedule. I try to leave, because this is I, I, one of the things when people say, what do I do to start slowing down, to, to let some oxygen into my diary, to get off this crazy treadmill? One of the things I suggest, it sounds a little bit paradoxical, is to schedule unscheduled time. You know, I sort of feel like we've almost reached that point where we have to ring fence off a couple of hours where we don't put anything in the, the, the diary, right, the planner, because nowadays we have such a neurotic relationship with time that we see a hole in our schedule, and instead of rejoicing and thinking, hmm, there's some downtime to look forward to, we panic and, and rush to fill it with something that's really often not that important. I get a great thrill, a great frisson, when someone calls up and says, I'm sorry, I can't make it to yes, lunch. I know, I know, I know. I can't, you know. Yeah, it's so terrible. And I, my God, you can't? That's yeah. terrible. And I, I love that. I think that's... <laughs> Can, can you give us, just let me ask you finally, would you, if you could be doctor, honorary for a moment, give us a prescription. How, what are the, are there some basic steps or fundamental things that we could do without killing ourselves yeah, to... Absolutely. To, I, I would say the first is, coming back to what I said before, just breathe. 
you know? If you feel that kind of very panicky, everything's moving way too fast and spinning out of control, just stop for a moment and breathe deeply five times, and it will make a physical difference, which can start to percolate up into how you feel in your head. Uh, a second suggestion, I guess what you're asking for is quick tips to slow down, is that right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'll rattle through these. Yeah, speed it uh, yeah. up, will you? We got, we We've got, got a, a deadline. Come on, come on, let's go. The clock is ticking. Come on, spit it out. Right. Um, the second, the second uh, quick tip would be uh, what I call a speed audit, uh, which is just, you know, every once in a while through the day as you're doing an activity, stop and ask yourself if you're doing that activity at the right speed. And if you're going too fast, slow down. Very simple. It's so often we find ourselves doing something more quickly than we need to just by default without even thinking about it. And it, it can be enough just to stop and say, am I driving too fast? Am I eating too fast? Am I reading this bedtime story too fast? And if the answer is yes, and very often it is, <laughs> Just go back a little more slowly. You just ask yourselves those questions. Just, and it comes some sense that little stop, uh, and that's free. No one even need know you're doing it. <laughs> so it can be a, a secret pleasure, um, and it works. Um, so I guess, I mean, that's, those are two suggestions. I think another thing is to, coming back to our use of time and our overscheduling and our cramming our schedules. You know, tomorrow, look at your, or even this evening when you go home, look at your, your diary for the week and pick one thing that's the least important and drop it. Like, just drop it. Like that lunch that you were yeah. happy to be canceling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, ring up and cancel that lunch you don't really want to go to. Just let, let it go. Um, and another thing of following on from that, I think, is that idea of scheduling unscheduled time. Set aside, say, I'm going to take two hours on Sunday morning when I don't let anything get into that time. And I arrive at whatever it is, 11 on Sunday morning, and suddenly I have that, you know, that cathedral space of, of, of slowness. And I can, I can go with the flow. I can rest. I can... I, I can enjoy a serendipity because we're so highly programmed and scheduled now. We don't, you know, people ring up, we can't follow because we've got to get on to the next thing. And then lastly, of course, technology. Uh, you know, take 30 minutes, say tomorrow, pick 30 minutes when you just switch everything off. It might be when you get up in the morning instead of manically reaching for your inbox, at, by, which probably yeah. is by your bed, just take 30 minutes, go have breakfast, and then after 30 minutes, look. Or maybe it's 30 minutes at lunch, or maybe it's 30 minutes when you come home from work and the first 30 minutes in the home, you talk to your partner, everything switched off, you talk to your partner, you talk to your kids, and, and those things actually can make quite a big difference in starting to... That Sunday morning probably. thing wouldn't work for me. <laughs> <That's> uh, <laughs> for various reasons. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> is, be, be, <laughs> before we go to the audience, have you noticed in, in the way you've embedded this in your, in your life, has it changed the way you relate to people. I mean, I don't just mean your children, your wife, but just folks. It does, and and I think in some ways that's the the real litmus test of slowing down, or the real the real payback is that re my relationships feel stronger. And you know, we try to accelerate absolutely everything, don't we? And there are there are some things that simply cannot be sped up, and and one of those has to be relationships. You know, you cannot make somebody fall in love with you faster because you want to get married in June, right? <laughs> or or you, cannot, you cannot forge an intimate friendship more quickly because you need someone to backpack around Europe with you in August, right? Uh, you know, th these things have a natural fixed time. And it's the same, you know, today we have 342 friends on Facebook, but when was the last time we spent a whole hour with one in the park talking face to face? And, and I think that when you slow down, that's one of the big, big uh, payoffs is that your relationships feel much more solid and more real because you're there. You're not, A, you're not kind of arriving in that sort of slightly agitated state looking, wondering if that's your phone vibrating. <laughs> you're there. And ultimately, you know, that's what the human condition is about. It's, it's about, we're, we're social animals. And it's about connecting with other people, I think. The book is The Slow Fix. The author is Mr. Carl Honore. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. There, a uh, microphone for people who have questions. I'm sure uh, Mr. Honore has raised a whole series of them, certainly in my mind. And if you just go to the mic, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Um, I just have to observe, you talk very fast. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you're, not, you're not the first person to observe that. <laughs> very speedy, frenetic kind of personality. That's one thing, but I wonder how you shine the lens of slow. Yeah. <laughs> you are on right now. Um, yeah, I on the speaking side, 
I guess that the, the essence of the slow philosophy is to do things at the right speed, right? And each person has their own metronome. And my metronome is definitely set on the higher end. <laughs> um, so I, but, I'm, but I'm speaking at a comfortable rate for me, and I don't feel like I'm rushing. Um, so that would be my take on the, the fast talking. Um, the second question is the book tour. I have to say that the book tour is probably the most challenging moment of, of, of my life as it happens at the moment for, for be, remaining Why? slow. Why is because, that? Because, because I, the, I, I guess one of the ways to control your pace is to have control of your time. And, I, and this is something you see in the workplace as companies realize that the best way to get you know, people to you know, energize about their work and creative is to give them control over their time. You know, set them a deadline, but then between here and there, you use your time however you want to. So it, if you want to go home at 2 in the afternoon to see your son play hockey, fine. You want to come in at midnight on Saturday, that's fine too. It's about you can use your own time, but you still have to deliver at the end. So in my own life, I feel I've got real control over my time. But on a book tour, of course, I have less control. But even so, I, 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 you know, there's nothing I can do. I, I, I don't feel anxious. I, I follow what I'm told to do. I turn up on time. I do my bit and I move on to the next thing. But, and I also make sure that I schedule enough time to recharge and... Um, you meditate? I do, yeah. Do you? Every yeah. day? Not every day, no. But I do, yes, yeah. Yes, ma'am, right behind there, yes. Your ideas is that you... You just speak up a bit, because... Do you want to get a new microphone? Believe, Maybe you can just shout out the question. I believe. <laughs> Whoa. I believe Check one, two. So far down the road in terms of problem solving, what's the other half? I think that's, I think that's true. Um, I think that one of the other components is the emotional side. That uh, especially when you're dealing with complex problems like well, any complex problem, really, whether it's mending a broken relationship or uh, fixing a broken school or dealing with po uh, poverty or climate, you've got to tap the emotions as well. And I think that goes beyond what we can just do rationally, I suppose it would be on. Well, perhaps in some cases you may wish to tap into the emotions first and leave the reason in, the, in your back pocket, so to speak. Yeah, and of course, reason is a, it can be a... a a, mis a misleading light because we're, we're, we're much less rational than we think we are. Uh, and that's one of the things that a lot of, uh, you know, psychology and psychological tests over the years have shown is that we, we think we're cleverer than we are and experts are very, very often wrong when they think they're right. Uh, so we've got to distrust those rationalist impulses and, and have other people sift them for us and, and test them over and over again. So we've got to be on our guard that what we think is rational may not be rational. And, and in a way that comes back to what I was alluding to earlier about uh, problem solving being, especially these complex problems, that one of the key elements in tackling any difficult problem is, is accepting uncertainty, that, that, that state of not knowing. Uh, and, and in fact, the final chapter in the book, I, really one of the conclusions I come to is that, what does it even mean to solve a problem? <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you solve climate change? Or will we, how, can we all agree on what fixing poverty looks like? I mean, it's, these things are all so nuanced and, and, and complex that to try and see it entirely through the lens of pure rationality and reduce everything to an algorithm or a, an equation or a graph seems to me to be absurd, really, and that we need to tap into other things like emotions and, and allowing ourselves to feel comfortable with, with not knowing, the state of not knowing for sure. Thank you. Yes, sir. If I could ask a question about unenlightened employers. Um, it seems to me that, well, you gave some examples of enlightened employers, um, that many employers today are using the technology to expect you to answer emails at 10.30 at night, um, be on call on the weekend, um, set unrealistic deadlines for projects because, uh, gee, there's 48 hours on the weekend. You can work on this and have it on my desk Monday morning. Can, can you just give us some idea of strategies to um, evangelize, convert the unenlightened? Yeah, <laughs> and it has to be said that the, um, the unenlightened 
seriously outnumber the enlightened in this moment. So, <laughs> so I'm sure your question resonates with a lot of people in this room. I think one way to, to tackle that, that resistance or that inertia is to, I think it has to be, people have to experience that slowing down works. It's, 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 an, it's, it's one thing to turn up with case studies and say, well, oh, look at Google or look at um, uh, Boston Consulting Group or look at all these companies that are using slow and thriving off it. It's quite another to experience it within your own company. And I think one thing that, that often works, and I've seen it work um, in, in companies before, is that people who believe that, they, that, that change, whether it's a, negotiating new cultural norms and protocols around the use of technology or rethinking the obsessive tightening of deadlines and that sort of thing, that, that the best way to tackle that is not to come in with all guns blazing and say, it's, it's my way or, or, or the highway, but to say, why don't we do a test run for a month, you know? Or why don't we have a week or two weeks when everybody is allowed to, to unhook and unplug for one day a week, or you know, whatever it is, depending on the company, and just see what it feels like. Because I think often what's going on in companies is that behind the facade, the kind of hardcore, we're all fast facade, everybody is quaking, and everybody is feeling the pinch and the pain. It's a bit like that final scene in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. <laughs> when you know the three, it, you know, ooh, and it's like they're all looking and we're waiting to see who's gonna crack first. And it's, it's sometimes it's enough for people just to have, to play a game with it, to have a week of trying, and then they see, actually, you know, this, this, isn't, this isn't so scary, and it's quite nice, and it's working, I'm, and, and the boss then experiences it as well. And I think that's often a useful way to come with the suggestion of just trying it, just trialing one thing. Um, and don't try and do it all at once, that would be unslow. You know, maybe it's just technology, or maybe it's the deadline, or maybe it's, um, you know. Thank you. Yes, Lunch sir. Hour. Yes, sir. Um, our contemporary society at this time has a lot of people working two or maybe three part-time jobs. In contrast, if you go back far enough, we'll say, let's say in the 60s or the 70s, a person might have a nine to five job. And strangely enough, we stop for lunch, maybe three quarters of an hour or one hour to recharge our batteries. Now, as a result of various corporate culture, that relaxing concept seems to have been eroded. Now, if we were going to go back to that, to have that relaxing hour lunch or three quarters of an hour time, whatever it is, would you contemplate or how would you contemplate reversing that back to those earlier years when the stress was a lot less? Because as a doctor said to me some years ago, Stress can kill. Well, in a way, I suppose it's similar to the, the answer to the, the question before. I think the way to contemplate it is to, is to get people to try, try it out. So uh, I, I met a, a company, uh, a guy who runs a company in New Zealand recently that takes uh, napping pods into big companies so people can have a siesta. And, and we're not talking about the traditional siesta of, you know, a whole bottle of Rioja and three hours sleep. <laughs> That's gone. That's gone forever, apart from maybe on your holidays. But you know, a kind of leaner and meaner siesta, a NASA approved 21 minutes nap and a glass of water before. And, and they take these, you know, taking them into the workplace and finding that people thrive on them. So it's again, it's that sort of getting people to experience it. Um, and, and you know, I think his hit rate is about 85% of the companies he goes into, they stay in. Um, they, they choose to have they the pods. They yeah. take it up or they create some space of their own yeah. uh, to follow up on it. So I think, again, it comes back to getting people to try because, because all of us are, as I say, we're behind the facade. I think we're all yearning for this. And in fact, it's, I think it's the young generation who give me a lot of hope because I think that the young people coming into the workforce now are looking at what you know, our gener older generations had and thinking, I'm not sure if I really want that. You know? I'm not sure if I want to sacrifice my health my relationship, my soul, <laughs> on the altar of the greasy corporate pole. I, I, want, I want something bigger. I want to be part of a company that has, yeah, I want meaning, purpose. They use this kind of language. I want a company that does good or doesn't do evil, like Google said. And if they don't get that, they'll walk. They'll set up their own company. They'll do corporate, you know, they'll do social enterprise. Uh, the boom in co-ops, you know, the, around the world, a billion people in co-ops now. Co-ops are a complete reworking of late, the late capitalist model. You know, they're slow fixes in action. You know, they take the long view. They look far beyond the bottom line. So these things are, these 
the tectonic plates are shifting below the surface, and this young generation coming up are pushing a lot of it. The problem, of course, is that the older generation are kind of standing in the way. So one example in Britain, when Britain has this uh, system whereby young doctors, junior doctors, have to do two years of just insane hours. They'll be doing 40-hour shifts, right? And the European Union came along and said, hang on, you can't do that. You know, you've got to cut the hours and so on. And the, the group that dug in its heels the most to resist that was older doctors. Right? Why do you think that was? It's because <laughs> you know, they're looking back and thinking, you know, I probably lost my marriage. I put on you know, 30 pounds. You know, why should you get such an easy ride? And I think that there's, there's a lot of bed blockers you know, higher up in the corporate world who've paid a high price for that fast forward approach. And they, I think there's a kind of envy and a, res a resistance to letting people do things differently. So you know, I, I sort of feel coming back to the fact that I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm, I'm a glass half full person on that issue. Well, there's a younger gentleman there. Maybe we can hear from him. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Honoré. Uh, my question is, do you find that this tendency to live in a fast-paced lifestyle is common throughout all cultures and age groups or more common in, say, developed countries? I think that it's pretty global now. I mean, obviously, if you go to a, an, an African village that has no electricity, then clearly you're back in old, slow. But wherever you go now in... The, the, across the developing world and emerging markets, what people are either living is the same pace that we're living at, or they're, they're yearning to. Um, so that the, I think that this is a, a kind of global moment. Uh, but by the same token, the, the, the kind of minority track or current to slow things down, to, to find that balance between fast and slow is also very strong. So I find that there's a lot of this talk about slowing going on down in um, you know, Latin America, uh, China, I hear a lot from people in China doing things, Taiwan, yeah. um, these very fast places. Um. The irony is the slow movement is rapidly catching on. Yeah, it's, <laughs> right. um, it's a very welcome irony, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious about your own journey with slowing down and whether um, it generated a, a journey in self-discovery, what you've discovered about yourself. Yes, I think, I think, it, I think it does, because I think one, as I talked about earlier, I think one of the things that you lose touch with is the self when you get caught in that spiral of speed. And I think that I, I had kind of lost, I think I'd lost my way a little bit. I guess I went into journalism originally to save the world. And I, I'm not sure what happened. I, I, <laughs> I didn't, I, I'm still trying to save the world now, but I, I think towards the end of my journalism career when things got really fast and I became that speed reading uh, father with Snow White, that I kind of moved away and, and everything just became a, a story to me. It was, it, was, it was a branch of the infotainment industry and then a celebrity was coming in and it just, and I kind of lost that compass a bit and slowing down made me realize, and I was unhappy. I knew something was not right and I couldn't quite put a finger on it, but slowing down allowed me to that, get that clarity, to look inside and work out what was ailing me. And I, I, I think I worked out that I had lost my compass and, I was do, and that's when I kind of moved out of journalism and moved into writing books and, and tackling some of these questions head on in a different form, long form. Um, so I suppose that kind of, in a way, I sort of saved myself <laughs> in a way. I have one just comment, really, not a question, but I was really intrigued by what you said. You kind of skipped over it at the very start, but something about effort. And I wondered how much slowing down then gives us all permission to put out effort towards things that <clears throat> have tremendous value in our lives. But because we've been taught to, that, you know, fast, 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 write the book overnight, that kind of thing, whether now slowing down really gives us all permission to do really what our ancestors did, which was take more time. That, that good things do take time, yeah. relationships, you know, works of art, you know, creativity, whatever. But I wondered if you might speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely true. And if, in fact, I think that is the essence of what the slow fix is about the book, is that, is that good things take time. You know, good solutions take time. Uh, and it's, it's the things you, you rattled through there. Uh, it's, you know, the, 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 the Apple, Apple is a good example, the, the Mac, you know, the, that took years of Steve Jobs, particularly sweating the small stuff, changing the motherboard and all, to create this object of late consumer 
capitalist beauty, right? Um, so I, I think I think that I, I suppose uh, I've now I'm, as a, you know that I'm on this book tour and I've just now started meeting the public and signing books for people, and I hadn't really thought before what I would sign as uh, you know the, the dedication. And without even thinking about it, I found myself signing uh, "Patience is still a virtue," yeah. and it's in some ways that kind of seemed to sum up to me what this is all about—that good things come to those who wait. And these are ancient ideas. In fact, I'm not saying anything new. I, I may be using new language or, or 21st century uh, vernacular to get it across, but these are ancient wisdoms. Uh, and, and I talk a lot about in the book, in Slow Fix, it's not about just patience, it's about humility. You know, the humility that, the, and this is a, a, a culture that militates against humility. You know, we're all photoshopping ourselves on Facebook and f full of all this blarney, <laughs> putting out this incredible image of our lives you know, in fact, that gets in the way of slow fixes because we, we can't admit that we're wrong. We can't admit we need help. And so there's a wonderful phrase, I think it's from T.S. Eliot. He talks about the wisdom of humility. Kundera talks about the wisdom of slowness. Uh, you know, patience is a virtue. These are ancient ideas uh, that uh, resonate right through the book, I think, in the idea. Uh, just two quick questions, if you can. Sure. Uh, it's been pointed out that you're a fast talker, but you're, here you are talking about slowness. And I'm just wondering, um, the fact that people do live their lives at different speeds, uh, and you're, I, I, from what I gather, advocating more um, mindful, contemplative uh, use and thought put into how one spends their time, and I love the Cuban expression, time is life, but I'm wondering, that creates conflict, and so you know, in terms of power relations that go on, in terms of those conflicts of different different paces that people go through, and I, I'm just wondering, is your main point um, sort of advocating more of an, a self-autonomous sense of where one directs their efforts in terms of its relation to time? Yeah, I, I think you put your finger on something very important there, which is that no man is an island, and you cannot just declare unilateral slow. You know, you've got to, and I didn't do it either. You have to talk to the people around you, explain what's happening, and understand that there's a ripple effect. And because we're all so interconnected, you, it's, it's hard to do every single thing every single day at the perfect tempo for you. You know, you've got to compromise. Sometimes you're going to go a little faster than you want. So it's about, you know, making those connections and allowing people to balance all those different metronomes and different tempos. Yes, sir. Last question. So I make it real quick. Um, so I think most societies would um, consider money, time is money. Um, so it's almost as if we need money to slow down, right? Like we save up money for vacation and stuff like that. So I think that's like if we slow down, then we might not make enough money to slow down. So it's kind of like a coup de sac there. So can you, <laughs> <laughs> can you like maybe um, comment on that? Um, well, I suppose if you think that money, are you, you're saying that money is what you need. Yeah, to, but yeah, that's like, what, see, people think. I think people have an idea of slow as being a kind of moneyed leisure pursuit. That to be slow, you've got to eat, you know, slivers of white Italian truffles and sip Barolo <laughs> wine, which is a lovely version of slow, but it's not, the, it's not the only one. You know, slow, a lot of slow is, is, is reading bedtime stories to your children at the right speed, you know, turning off your television. And th these things are free. Uh, and in, in a way, I think ultimately of slow as a state of mind. It's a chip in your head that you change. And if you arrive at every moment trying to do whatever it is, not as fast as possible, but as well as possible, then you're a poster boy for slow, right? It's like shifting gears, like you uh, mentioned, right? Like slow, fast, slow, fast. Yeah, it's about slow shifting those, those gears. And sometimes you find, you know, you, 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 you slow down at work, and I, my view is that if you slow down judiciously in the right sort of way at work, you'll actually be more productive. So you may end up making more money <laughs> and being able to afford those white truffles. <laughs> Maybe. Thank you. The, the, other, the other night I was trying to get my teenage son to hurry up with something. And he turned to me and he said, come on, Pop, YOLO, YOLO. <laughs> and I said, what the hell is YOLO? YOLO, you only live once. <laughs> There's insights. For the mouth, from the mouths of babes. <laughs> it's a Carl Honore. <laughs> Thank you. Thank That's you. Wonderful. That was terrific. <laughs> Thank you.